I'm um, going to talk a little bit about using GeoGebra as a problem solving tool. Um, I'm going to talk about my experiences of using it with students in a problem solving class. But also um, I hope to um, have an opportunity to get all of you to use it, or those of you who want to try using it during this session. So we'll try and do both of those things. Um, it's dynamic mathematics software. It's um, been around for a while. It's designed to allow you to do experiments with mathematics, really, and to explore um, mathematics. Um, other software is available, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not associated with GeoGebra as a, as a um, project. It's something that I've used myself, and it's something that's substantially changed the way I teach, and something I found very useful. But actually, I'm sure that many of the effects that I'm describing today, or the experiences that I've had, could have been achieved with other software. So um, if this software isn't for you, or if you already have some software, then, then, well, then that's fine. There is another message beyond this particular artifact that we're going to have a look at today. But I thought it would be very useful to motivate all this to just describe um, my personal journey, if you like, why I started using this, and what I wanted to achieve. Why, why, was, I, uh, why was I spending my time with this software? Um, I started using GeoGebra in 2006 because I wanted to typeset diagrams for a book. Uh, which might sound a bit odd, um, but I'm sure my, you may have had an experience of wanting to typeset a mathematical diagram which is a accurate and aesthetically appealing. Okay, So uh, if you're going to say this is an equilateral triangle, it jolly well ought to be an equilateral triangle, right? And the labels need to be positioned properly and a consistent distance away from the thing they're labelling. And before I came across GeoGebra, I was drawing them on graph paper, calculating the coordinates, typing in the coordinates to typeset the diagram. Okay? There were point-and-click tools, of course there were, but they were never quite right. They, never, they weren't mathematical. So this is the sort of typical situation that I found myself in. This is GeoGebra. And you have a, um, this is actually a linkage mechanism. And with GeoGebra, it's dynamic. So you can drag one point. Here I'm dragging this blue point. And the configuration that I've constructed uh, is maintained in some way. And what I wanted to do to start with was to take a diagram like this. It represents a linkage mechanism. Well, does it look better like that? Probably not going to typeset it like that, are you? You're, or m maybe that's a different configuration. The point of this, if we turn the trace on, is that that point actually moves in a perfect straight line. And that was the point of the the point of what I was writing, but actually I just wanted to be able to drag these diagrams to a nice position that illustrated what I wanted that was mathematically accurate, and that's where I started. So it was really, um, well, it was really nothing to do with having dynamic software. <laughs> I mean, there you go. So that's where I started with all this. And then very quickly, um, you realize that, uh, well, you can put applets on the website. I mean, a static diagram doesn't show you the way that thing folds up nicely. So actually, you want, the, you want that dynamic experience as well. So I started posting applets. And then when I got a bit more confident using the software, I would um, demonstrate things in lectures. Okay, So that was, it actually started to become a teaching tool. But it was a bit back to front, and I confess that. Uh, I think there are some strengths in that, because by the time I gained enough confidence to use this live with a group of students. I'd already played around with it quite a lot, and I was practiced with it, and I knew what to do. Right? So I thought I would start by just um, uh, showing you one, uh, we go, new window, one sort of demonstration that I would do in a lecture. And I'll go through this a bit more slowly in a moment. GeoGebra has um, a number of parts. The most obvious part is the graphics window. Okay, but on the left, it also has an algebra window here, and then at the bottom, there's an input bar. Okay? And I'll demonstrate all those three things in a moment. And along the top, there are various buttons. And this is the new point button, so I'm going to click on that, and then I'm just going to click somewhere in here. And I've created a new point. So, um, and that point has a geometric life on the right. It is a point in the plane. And it has an algebraic life in the left in the algebra window. Okay? Um, options, font size, let's just all make this a bit bigger. So you can, in a lecture, you'd probably want to make it all a little bit bigger. 
And then in the input bar, you can type in, you could type in the coordinates. So that's a point naught comma naught. Let's get rid of that. I don't really want that. Or you can type in an equation. And that's the equation of a circle, and it draws the circle. Now, one of the things, sort of demonstrations that I might use in a lecture is complex numbers. So if we right click on this and go to object properties, we can, and we go to algebra, we can consider that to actually be a complex number, not a Cartesian point. And now it's changed its representation to being a complex number. Okay? And one of the things that I would, in the right teaching moment, of course, is I might want to square that complex number. So Z1 is the square of A, and we might, we might ask ourselves what happens when, well, 1 squared is 1, and as we go round the unit circle, the modulus stays the same, but the argument doubles. And of course, it goes round twice. I say, of course, well, anyway, there's a whole teaching story there, isn't there? I mean, <laughs> that's the whole, but, but you can see there's something nice and dynamic about this. So if, for example, I wanted to find all the numbers which, when squared, give me b, what we're doing is we are, um, well, we're trying to get z1 onto b, aren't we? So there's that one. And there's also, because we go around twice, there is ooh, somewhere over here, perhaps. There we go. But there's something nice and dynamic and a bit more engaging, or potentially more engaging, than a static diagram. I have stopped drawing quadratic curves on the chalkboard, right? I mean, I don't do that anymore. I use this. And I think it's really changed the way I teach. Um, so those of you who've got GeoGebra, let's get, let's get started. Um, and I thought, we'd, I thought I would ask you to do one construction. Um, and it's the tangent to a cubic through the average of two roots. Can I just ask, firstly, how many people have used GeoGebra before? How many people haven't at all? OK, right, thank you. And how many people have seen this problem before? Because that's sort of cheating. Good, OK, great. That's, uh, so you don't, you've not seen this problem before. That's excellent. There's always a problem, isn't it, if you know half the class are, and know what you're gonna, what's coming. The surprise goes. So let's load up GeoGebra. And let's go to File, New. I'm going to not save that. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct a cubic polynomial through four points in the plane. So the first thing to do is to go to the... Um, and make sure that the New Point tool is selected. So you, you, you move up and you click on A here. And I'd like you to click three times on the x-axis. So A, B, and C and then one point on the y-axis. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a cubic that goes through those four points. Now, if you want to check that your points are really on the axes, then you can use the, the arrow move tool and just drag them up and down. So by clicking on the axis, I've constrained them to be on the axis. You could put them anywhere in the plane, but, but for this demonstration, it's important that they're on the axis. OK? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and find the cubic through those uh, four points. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm just going to type it in. I'm going to make a root at A. So I could type x minus the x-coordinate of A. That term in a polynomial would have... Can everyone see the font size? Is that large enough? Is, would, would you like me to make it larger? I can make it a bit larger. Yeah. Let's make it larger. So I've typed, in the, in the input line, I've typed x minus x of a. And the reason I've chosen this particular example is one of the few times I've actually had to ask for help was when I couldn't work out how to get the coordinate of a point in the plane. And it's just x of a. So actually, if, so that, there we are. That was the, that's why I've told you, because it was one of the few times I got stuck. Right. How did you find the answer? Uh, I, I emailed the forum, and they were extremely helpful, and they came straight back and said, oh, it's trivial, you just do X of A. And of course it is, of course it is. How, do, how can I not know that? Okay. <laughs> now, I don't really want to do this for a good reason. I'm, I'm going to change this. I'm actually going to do 1 minus X divided by the X of A. Okay? Which is not perhaps the first way you'd get a root at, at A. 
And then I'm going to copy all that and I'm going to multiply it by itself three times. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to edit the A to a B and a C. So I've now got the product of three terms, each of which will give me a root at A, B and C respectively. OK? And then the last thing, the reason I've done x over x of a is that at 0, we've got 1 times 1 times 1. So now I can multiply the whole thing by y, the y-coordinate of d. And I'm reasonably confident that that's going to give me the cubic that goes through those four points. Yeah, cut and paste on an iPad might not be so comfortable, so I ap <laughs> apologise to those of you who are uh, without a keyboard. Is it possible to get the input back again? Yeah, if you press the up key, uh, you get your history of your input, so that's very useful to know. And control Z is undo and there's a redo button so you can you can uh, control Z Yeah. <laughs> control Z, yeah. Okay. Are we are we happy with that so far? So this illustrates the um, the algebraic side of GeoGebra. That of course there'd be more of a story with the students as to why that's the cubic and all the rest of it. But anyway, uh, this illustrates how you can type in an algebraic expression and it will plot the graph. So even just as a graph plotter, this is potentially, I think, quite a useful tool. I've, I've gone straight for the kill here in making it a dynamic graph. If I now drag these points, then the cubic will adapt because it is, the cubic is a dependent object and it depends on A, B, C and D and it is the cubic that I wanted. Okay, so again, you can... Um, use that in a variety of ways to illustrate a whole range of interesting phenomena. But what I want to switch to now is some of the uh, more button-based constructions because you can build up geometric constructions using the buttons. Now we can see at the top under the file edit view men this normal menu there is a range of buttons. But they're actually more than their first appear because if we hover the mouse over the bottom right hand corner um, I think you can just about see there's a little down arrow that goes red. Not the most obvious interaction perhaps, but if you click once the down arrow is red, it reveals a whole list of related tools. So I've, I have got the um, perpendicular line tool. Now these, are, these tools are all related to perpendiculars, parallels, tangents and so on. And what I want to do is I want to go along and go for the points tools. These are all the points, these are all the tools related to points. And I want the midpoint tool. So we want the midpoint or centre. And I want to construct the midpoint of AB. Okay? Now there are two ways to do that. I could type, click on the diagram A and then B, and it will construct the midpoint for me. Okay. Now that's quite often fiddly on a diagram, so I can equally go over to the left in the algebra window and click on A and B, and it will construct, or you can mix and match. So if your diagram is cluttered and fiddly, you can go over to the algebra window to make sure you're selecting the things that you wanted. All right. And now what I want to do is choose the perpendicular tool and construct the perpendicular to the x-axis through the point E. And then I want to go back to the points menu and select the intersection of two objects. And I want to find the intersection between the function and the line. Can anyone think of an alternative way of constructing the point F from what we've done so far? What is F, sorry? 
Yes, so I clicked on the line A and the function F, and I've got the, in the intersection point. Right, so we could construct the point, which is X of E, comma, F of X of E. Yep, so you could do that. So we're going to construct a point, X of E, comma, F of X of E. Oh, missed my brackets. There we go. So there's always, there's, yeah, there is always more than one way to achieve the end that you want. Right, and that just partly depends on your preferences, whether you want to make a particular point about the intersection between curves or the algebraic evaluation of a function, or just depends. Yeah, but there's often more than one way to achieve that effect. You can also, there are command lines. I use the tool to find the midpoint. You can type in midpoint, right? Now, there are functions for all the button names and vice versa. Right, and now the last thing is I'm going to go back to the menu here and find the tangent. So I'm going to find the tangent to the function at the point f. And then I'm going to right click on that, object properties, and I'm going to make it look pretty by turning it red. OK. So again, once a diagram gets cluttered, it's sometimes helpful to use colour to illustrate the differences. So that was lucky. Um, it's gone through C. It appears to go through C. So if this was my book, that might, be, you know, that might be a special case. So I might want to highlight that, or I might want to avoid that. Yep. Well, is, is it a special case? Or is, it, or, is, <laughs> or is this really always the case? I mean, is the tangent to the midpoint of two adjacent roots on a cubic, does it always go through the third root? Okay, it appears to. So there's a conjecture that you could then send the students away and they can prove that, whether that's the case or not, and so on. All right? I just meant you need to select an arrow all the time yeah. to move anything. Thank you, yes. yes. That's, that is a frustration. I sort of instinctively do that now. It's very easy yeah. to... Um, is that moving? It, well, it's not moving, or you've suddenly created another construction because you keep clicking on things and then you've made a construction based on the points that you're clicking on, yeah? Thank you, That's a, that is a, you do always have to go back to your move tool. So, so there we go, that's in essence, that's, that should get you started in being able to use this. Uh, that was more than, <laughs> well, that was, that was more help than I got when I started and I did literally just sat down in front of it and, and, and got on with it, right? I mean, it was... And I what do you do when people react? They don't, they're not jumping up or... <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm sorry for joy. Like, I, when I show something like that, I'd be so enthusiastic. Yeah. They're looking like, they're probably checking their email or something like that. <laughs> well, I it, so despondent. It, yeah, I know. Well, it is, uh, it, this at least is a bit more dynamic. You can, there is something, at least we've got a conjecture now that we might be interested in pursuing. You know, there is this interesting invariant. We've done a mathematical experiment, if you like, and now we need to prove uh, whether that's really the case and whether any special cases and, I mean, what happens when the roots aren't adjacent, right? I mean, so there are things to do, aren't there? There are things to explore and, and that, that's... Um, but of course, this software was really designed for school students, high school students, actually. I'm, I'm amazed how much use it is, can be put to at universities. Um, there is, uh, if we go to view spreadsheet, there is a spreadsheet window. So each of these cells can be an object like a curve or a line or a circle. And there is a computer algebra system in it now as well. So there's a lot here for people to explore that I'm not going to demonstrate today. A, lot, a lot's happened in the last uh, 10 years with this, the gradual incremental but in its essence, I think it's reasonably easy to start with, and it's a very beautiful thing. But it was designed for students to use, right? I mean, that's what the, that was the whole point of it, was the students should be using this. I wanted to typeset static diagrams on a printed page, which is right at the far end of the intention of the authors of this software. That's not why they, they, they designed the software. And so ultimately, I did use it with students in a problem-solving class, a mathematical problem-solving class, and it was called Developing Mathematical Reasoning. And the 
class is what was styled or called a Moore method class uh, after Robert Lee Moore, who was a Texan topologist. And it was an optional first. This is while I was at the University of Birmingham. So I've been in Loughborough for two years. And um, I ran this in Birmingham. It was small groups, 10 to 20 students. And the aim of this course was to develop mathematical confidence, to develop problem solving. It wasn't to cover stuff. There are plenty of calculus, core calculus courses and methods courses where they learn a lot of traditional mathematics, rightly so. This was all about getting them to solve problems. And it was set up before I took it over by Chris Good, my colleague, uh, who had come across this teaching technique from a, uh, an, a collaborator in the States. I taught it for many years, uh, as did other colleagues in parallel. Uh, it was, originally it was a purely optional course, but after a while we actually expected our master students to take it. And there would be an awkward conversation with them if they wanted to do something else. Well, it was awkward for them. Uh, and ultimately, we never refused to allow anyone to opt out. Of course not. But they had to have a good reason why they weren't going to take this course. Because it was quite a tough course. And they were supposed to be the, student, the more ambitious students. Okay. So that was, the, that was the course. And this is how it works. The teacher will pose problems to the whole class. And the students will solve them independently. And this is quite an important aspect of it. This isn't a group work module, although absolutely many students did work together outside the class. And there's, as a teacher, you have to take a view on whether you would encourage that more absolutely forbid it. I was a bit more easygoing about it. But the goal is the students would solve it independently. So when they come, they're not doing group work in the class. They come to the class prepared. That was the point of that. Students would then present their solutions to the class and they would discuss it and decide whether they were correct. So the, this is, I mean, notice the teacher isn't there at all on that slide. I'm not there at all. I'm just in the room. I'm not presenting things in the way I'm presenting this now. All right? Um, it took place in a, in a teaching context. We have 120 credits a year, 20 credits per module. So modules were always 20 credits and this was half a module. So there would be one semester of a traditional course and this would be the other half of the course. And the assessment was on the quality of their best two presentations. So there were presentation marks. Every student had to come to the board more or less randomly, although by the end of the semester I would pick on people that hadn't given enough presentations yet. Yeah. So to make sure everyone had a fair opportunity. And they had to write up answers to all the problems themselves and hand them in. So they would come to a presentation by one of their peers and on the basis of that they should have been able to solve the problem and they had to write it up neatly and hand it in. Which is no different really than coming to a lecture course and being shown something and then having to write it up and hand it in. So um, that was the assessment and notice there's no exam, right? There's no exam in this course. We didn't require them to use GeoGebra, but I strongly encouraged it and I showed them how to use it and by and large they did. I'll come back to that. One of the interesting things that this course developed is a discussion about what it meant to be correct. Okay, what is a proof? That was really one of the goals of the course, to develop, is that a proof? And, it, and interestingly, and not at all surprisingly, students' concept of proof was initially very algebraic and students were entirely unhappy with a purely geometrical argument working with symmetries or similarities or congruences is that a proof no no it, no that's cheating that's just you know that's just a trick so this business of what a proof was was one thing that we wanted to develop during the course explicitly wanted to develop during the course and so a discussion about what correct was no, the work is correct when everyone understands it, when, there's n when, there are no, when they can find no technical or logical mistakes, and that everybody is confident that more detail could be given on request. So you don't expect, like a research seminar, you know, if, if, the, if there is a case that's obviously the same, you're not going to go through every bit of detail if you're confident that it really is the same. And that the, so there was some discussion about the level of detail required. And also, uh, well, is it complete? Have we got the special cases? With geometrical constructions, if it involves a triangle, what happens when those three points lie in a straight line? I mean, there are going to be some degenerate cases. So, we'd, we'd, you know, and often my role was mostly on this last one. 
in pointing out the you know, opportunities for degenerate cases and well what happens there and there'd be some head scratching and they'd go away and come back with a with an answer quite often we would stay on one problem for two or three weeks right I mean this is not a rapid process and the students were often quite frustrated at the apparent slowness that we're not actually achieving anything even though I think we're achieving a lot it wasn't covering stuff okay so this is a long way from copying a model expected answer quite a lot and only it's, and I, re, I remind everyone this is groups of 10 to 20 okay so this is not a big lecture course everyone is in the room so two four six we've got seven people on this table so this is at most two tables worth right you get to know people, they get to know each other, and that's part of it. One of the key distinctive features of this teaching method is the structure in the problems. These are not isolated puzzles, they actually lead somewhere. So the goal uh, is ideally leading, leading to a major result. Now, of course, to the students, these appear to be isolated puzzles. Right? <laughs> so it's only later on that there is, oh, that problem was really a special case of this one, or this one and this one combined to give us a third one, even though initially we did the third one in an entirely independent argument. So revisiting problems later on was one of the things. Of course, so to some students, they might just never get that, right? And it just, it's just puzzling. And that's, so it's quite a high-risk sort of strategy. But the goal, the setting of the problems, choosing the problems is the key. And that's the hard work for the teacher, is choosing the problems. And that's a really interesting design challenge for the teacher in setting up this course. Moore chose topology because he was a topologist. I'm not a topologist. I don't know enough topology. Um, I chose geometry. And I chose um, machine parts and machine uh, linkages and, and kinematics, the geometry of machine movement, which I was particularly interested in at the time, just because it was interesting. Um, Franz Rullio wrote a lot about this, cams, linkages, and this is the first problem from my course, um, which I have spoken about before, so some of you may have seen this problem. A ladder is standing on a smooth floor against a wall, and it slides down, and there is a cat uh, sitting in the middle of the ladder. What's the path that the cat takes? Right, that's the problem. So hands up, how many of you have seen this problem before? One, okay. So what I'd like you to do in the next five minutes is use GeoGebra to model this problem. Come up with a GeoGebra worksheet from scratch that will illustrate the answer to this problem, even if you already know the answer. And if you don't know the answer, then this might give you a conjecture as to what the answer is, okay? Many of you have reached a sort of predictable impasse. Okay, so who's stuck? Who's probably right? Yeah, right. What, so, why, so why are you stuck? Right, so you've got an elastic ladder, haven't you? Okay, so how, what might we do to, um, to get round that problem? Any suggestions? So, so there's some interesting interrelationship between an independent point, you might drag, uh, are we assuming that we're dragging the bottom of the ladder? So if you drag the bottom of the ladder, what's going to happen to the top of the ladder? So how are you going to find the top of the ladder? Where is the top of the ladder? I mean, it, there, are, there are a range of places it could be, can't there? What are the, where, what are the potential places for the top of the ladder? It's on a circle of fixed radius, isn't it? But we know something else about it, don't we? And the y-axis. It's on well, it's on the wall, yeah, which you might have assumed is the y-axis. Is that yep? Yeah? Yep. Right. So it's the intersection between a circle of fixed radius and the line that you chose. So there's an implicit solve going on, isn't there? A solution of an intersection of one curve and another. Okay. One of the reasons for, for pre-preparing this is it certainly when I first started using GeoGebra in lectures, I wasn't going to just start with a blank worksheet and build up my construction because you know I wasn't confident enough to do that, frankly, in it's technology and it's got to work. If you're in front of a big group in a lecture, certainly it's got to work. There's no, there's no two ways about it. So one of the things it's possible to do is to create a construction and then step through it by just clicking the arrow button, right? And it will build it up for you. And it's still possible at each stage that the th to move the parts as a dynamic construction. So if I click here, there's my point A, and at any stage I can move A and as to build the construction. 
So as I've already said, the first stage to this construction is to define B as the intersection of a circle. Uh, in fact, there is a circle there, but I made it grey, so let's make it red. Um, oh. Escape. Let's get rid of that. Properties. Colour. Red. OK, so the ladder is a fixed length, and so the, end, the far end of the ladder will be a fixed distance away from the point A, so it must lie on a circle. So that's where the other end of the ladder can be. And then equally, we know the ladder hits the wall, so it must be the intersection between the circle and the wall. Right? Now, one of the experiences of using GeoGebra is if you can create the construction in GeoGebra, you have a certain sort of understanding about the underlying problem. It really helps, in my experience, to sort out what is the independent and dependent objects, because you've got to build the construction. That's actually in itself a really helpful process. And quite often when students come and say, I can't do the GeoGebra construction, underlying that is a misunderstanding about the relationships between the objects. If they really understood the relationships between the objects, then the construction would follow naturally from that. Right? So here we go. Um, there's the point B. There's the ladder. You can put a little diagram in if you like. Midpoint. And now we can do the experiment to get our conjecture that the cat actually travels on what looks like a circle. OK? Lots of people think it, it does the goes the other way, like a 1 over x. Um, but it doesn't. Yep. Is there any way of actually getting the equation or some sort of equation from the or is that part of Well, let's see if we can. Right. I mean, that, that's the key. We've, got to, we've done an experiment. We've got a lot of points. Can we prove? That, that, that what the locus of that point is. Um, there is a locus command. Um, uh, so the point creating the locus is M, and the point moving is A. So I've got to think about my dependent and independent, and sure enough, it comes up with that. Now I think, I think underlying GeoGebra at the moment, there is a Grobner basis package that will allow you to do some quite sophisticated maths it knows that A is on a straight line, and it knows all the other dependencies, so you get a system of polynomials, and it will eliminate and find the locus as an algebraic curve. That's quite sophisticated, right? Um, so I think so. Um, but it's slow, right? I mean, that's, you know, arbitrarily, that could be really horrible. Um, but we can do it much more simply than this. What, what most of the students do on the first is just to use Pythagoras' theorem. Yeah, if you just set up some coordinates and use Pythagoras' theorem, you can prove that the point M is a constant distance away from O. But there's also a very neat geometric proof uh, which involves putting an identical ladder and making an X. Right? I mean, you just look at... You can, you, I'll leave you to prove all the similarities and congruences and do your triangle theorems and all the rest of it, and you can come up with a completely... Uh, geometric argument that doesn't involve coordinates at all. And this is what I wanted to illustrate in the, in the problems chosen for the course. There were often a hideous way of doing things with coordinates and algebra and a very neat way of doing things in geometry. And so that challenged the idea of what is a proof and how do we prove something and so on. That was the goal of my course. Does that make sense? Okay. Now this looks like a sort of trivial problem. This little mechanism looks like a trivial problem, but actually uh, there is a certain grammar to these little mechanisms, like the cat on the ladder. The red thing, this is an ellipsograph, which is designed to draw an ellipse. If the cat is not at the midpoint, it, the cat will move along an ellipse. It's like just a trammel for creating an ellipse. And this is another mechanism that, for creating an ellipse, called an ellipsograph. And the red thing there, the, um, I actually have to come over, I'll use the mouse. This point is constrained to move in a straight line, right? This is a fixed point, and that is like the cat in the middle of the ladder. So this is the ladder, that's the cat, and that is now fixed. So if you reverse the mechanism, okay, and have a linkage from the origin to the cat, and then you have the ladder fixed where the cat is, the other point must also move in a straight line. You've reversed the mechanism. So these mechanisms can be used in both directions. So part of the problems in my course 
actually used, um, built up a series of problems all related to locuses and one constraints and then reversing the constraints and, and so on. So the problems actually went in a, in a coherent direction. I got them from this very lovely book. I certainly didn't write these problems. Uh, not, not, it took me three runs through this course before I had the confidence to design my own problem set, right? Because that's a real challenge if you're running a course like this. I, uh, and I don't underestimate that. I did write a set of problems for this course eventually, um, but that's another story. But I, I, I got the problems from this book. It's a lovely book. Uh, I like geometry. The students haven't done much geometry. I think there's some modelling aspects. So I think I've mentioned most of these things already. This was, I wanted geometry, a geometry course, um, because the students have got little prior knowledge. Some of our students in Birmingham have uh, further maths A level and some only have A level. So they come to university with a, quite a wide variety of different levels of experience and competence at calculus and algebra. That's not great in a problem solving situation. I wanted something where there was a level playing field and that's why I chose geometry. Um, I think these problems have a modelling aspect to them. Not perhaps modelling in the sense of applied maths, where you are neglecting things and making approximations, but modelling in the sense of taking a problem, written in this form, and from it creating a diagram that's properly labelled with the relationships and so on, and using that to solve the problem. And that's modelling, uh, pre-modelling perhaps but modelling, setting up a mathematical problem. So there's a whole range of reasons why I chose these problems and ran it in that way. And by and large, I think it's run successfully. Um, these were the questionnaire results from 2008. What's a proof? Now I asked the students at the end of the course, what's a proof? A logical step-by-step -step argument with no unnecessary steps that shows without doubt the statement is true. All right, fair enough. Has your concept of proof changed? So these are three different students. Yes, at first my idea was of a proof was writing long chunks of work and simply hoping the correct proof was in there. That's <laughs> the uh, monkeys and the typewriters approach, perhaps. As I gained more experience, I found that a proof is concise and to the point. Rather than writing pages and pages for a proof with unnecessary info, I learned to shorten my work. How often do our students go back and revise their work? This course was really required to go back, we'd spend weeks on a problem, two or three weeks, go back and come back next week when you've patched this up. Yeah? Revise it, that's what we should be doing. Not, and then two other students, yes, a long-winded argument, the most satisfying proof is a short one. Yes, I used to feel that complicated long proofs always were the best, and I can appreciate that's far from true. So this, this appreciation of elegance and economy and so on. Did anything surprise you? The amount of work and how hard it was? Well, we would typically, in a week, do one or two of these problems. This was the first problem, right? And it would take a week uh, because you'd have to struggle through it. So they found it hard work, but you wouldn't look like there was a lot of stuff happening. But there was because the students were really engaged in it. And uh, the workload at the beginning, but as I got used to it, it helped me a lot with other courses, especially this 1B, which is our fir was our first year real analysis course. First year real analysis is often used as a vehicle for um, teaching proof um, and the students reported that this benefit had crossover benefits. I'm not sure if it counted as an event but just the fact that I liked geometry. Before the course I would have said I didn't like it but now I realise that's not true. I'm not sure whether it's geometry or whether they enjoyed the fact they were properly engaged with something that they were really doing. So I'm um, not <laughs> because uh, Chris Good didn't use geometry, he used topology, and Cornelius Hoffman didn't use geometry either, and they got exactly the same effect. So I don't think it actually has anything to do with geometry. I think it has a lot to do with engagement and exploration. But GeoGebra was particularly useful in this context with the geometry course. Now, this was not a uh, uniform success. I hope people get this reference. Um, <laughs> You know, this, this course did divide the student group and there were some students who really didn't like it and didn't react well to it and did not gain confidence as a result of it. And I was always worried about those people. I'm not suggesting that this was a panacea. And then there was a third group of students. Um, there is this rare honesty from a young man because only one person failed the course this year so I know uh, he had uh, relinquished his anonymity by saying this. Overall, I think this was an extremely interesting course in a way I wish I'd turned up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I had no idea how much hard work it would be, and I definitely struggled to keep up. It's obviously my fault, and I will have to retake it. But I think it's a tiny bit unfair that people gain 20 credits doing the other course, which I could have easily passed without paying much attention. <laughs> I think the main problem is that at Birmingham, the MOMD is a module outside the main discipline. That's the code for the optional course, MOMD. So I think the main problem is that an MOMD at Birmingham is seen as a bit of a joke and easy credit, which perhaps it is. Okay? This was not the case with this course. The students really had to work. Anyway, I'm sorry if this seems a tiny bit direct and rude, as I don't want to come across that way, as I think it was a well-run course, just one I probably shouldn't have done. <laughs> so there's a rare moment of honesty from one of our first-year students, but I, perhaps you recognise that problem. I mean, it was surprisingly stable, though. You know, I ran this for years, and we ended up in the same place every year. It sort of went the same way. And it went like this, anticipation, excitement and enthusiasm, frustration, despair. <laughs> now, there was this low moment in week four or five when we've done four or five problems, right? Now, this was really quite difficult. And gradually, you really got to the point where it was a lot of fun and the students really were getting something from it. And they would fly. And it was sad. Now, I don't think this was the fact that by week 11 they knew it was nearly over. I mean, that is one possibility here, of course. I accept that. But I don't think it was that at all. And, I, and it, wasn't obvious, it, it wasn't obvious who uh, was really going to fly in this course. And it was sometimes, it was often a surprise who woke up and thought, actually, I really enjoy this now. So, but not everyone enjoyed it. This is how they used GeoGebra, because GeoGebra is great for an experiment. And students would often come to the board with their pre-prepared GeoGebra worksheet and demonstrate something, but then they would have to write on the board over the top of it or on a board to the side to give the proof. Because an experiment is not a proof, is it? I mean, it doesn't justify anything. I mean, it tells you the answer. We can see it's a semi-quarter circle, but that doesn't prove that it's a quarter circle. So there's a difference between an experiment and a proof. So how might this play out in a mathematical support context? Well, one of the things I think this allows us to do is play around, which is sometimes hard to do. Well, what happens? Let's plot the graph. Let's have a look. Let's do that. And developing this habit of mind of playing around in students, I think, um, raises confidence. Uh, always plot the graph. Yeah, have a look at the graph. What does the graph do? What does that tell us? Are there real roots here? Yeah. Does this quadratic have real roots? So let's plot the graph. Just type in the equation into GeoGebra and plot the graph and have a look. It forces you to focus on relationships. I'm sure some of you are getting frustrated that you couldn't find a non-elastic ladder, but that's a, you know, an, in, you know, an independent and dependent object. So it makes you focus on relationships. And I think there's an interesting non-algebraic mode, which we couldn't do before without a computer. Um, how am I doing for time? Not bad. Yes, well, some of you will be sitting there thinking, that's lovely, Chris, but I don't have time. You know, you've, this, this, these photos were taken pretty much in the same place. This is down here on the right. Um, you know, you, you, you feel a bit like this, really. And uh, it's uh, lonely and cold and you're busy and you feel snowed under when really you'd much be rather flying around having fun. Um, so I do appreciate that is a problem with any software like this. And you have to invest some time so you might be at the anticipation and excitement stage of using GeoGebra after today, and you'll go away, and you'll, um, you'll get a bit frustrated, and then you'll be despairing that you can't get it to do that really easy thing, like find the x-coordinate of a point, which should be trivial uh, if you knew how. But actually, my experience has been if you invest that time, uh, it really there is a payback at the end of it. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a go. Static diagrams for handouts. I mean, if that's, if that's useful, then that's where I started. Uh, Pre-prepared diagrams in lectures with steps in the way that I've demonstrated my cat on the ladder. That's great when I first started, when I didn't have the confidence to actually do those constructions live. And I still do that if it's a particularly awkward construction, like I did with the linkages. Those linkages are actually lots of circles superimposed there's a solve going on, and then you delete the circles, you hide the circles and put the segments in, right? So there's a lot of faffing about to get that linkage diagram to work. So pre-prepare something there. 
I do start with a blank sheet, and I start with a blank sheet because actually I like to show the students how to go about the construction. It's not often, it's not that hard, as I did with the complex number one, right? You know, you just right-click, turn it into a complex number. You could do this for yourselves, is the message. Um, I've used it with students and problem solving, and I've used it a lot in the support centre in Loughborough. The number of times I get my laptop out and say, look, let's have a go. Let's just let's look at the diagram. And I think that's immensely valuable for students. So there we go. Thank you. It varied from year to year, actually, with staff availability and things like study leave, and so no two years were the same. And I was really worried the first time the formal Euclidean geometry course came before mine. Actually, I was rather cross about it. I thought that would be the preferred option. Well, um, it, I, I, I am saying this on camera, so I should be a bit diplomatic. <laughs> but the truth is, it didn't make the slightest bit of difference. Uh, because the formal Euclidean geometry course was like a traditional lecture course. They learnt stuff and memorised it, but they did, still couldn't solve problems having done that. So it didn't actually matter. It was fine, uh, which was a bit of a surprise and a worry the first time I ran it. But um, You'd imagine that they'd have built up a certain knowledge, ge ge geometric knowledge, and then having access, they'd have banged more out of the algebra as a consequence. Well, I gi I'll give you a very interesting example of that, because in the geometry course, they'd done the circle theorems, Right, and the circle, uh, the um, is it th I can't remember the proper name now. Well, the angle is always the same. You have a segment. I could just do the GeoGebra sheet, couldn't I? I mean, you have a circle, and you have a segment, and then you have a third point. Uh, new. Have I got time to do this? Yeah. So let's do a circle. I'm going to zoom out. Uh, oh, zoom in. Zoom out. And we have our segments. And we'll do another segment. So I'm going to move the point E, and we know the angle at E stays the same. Right? That's those kind of... They'd done all those theorems, and they'd proved them and all the rest of it. But a lot of my problems were uh, involved locuses. So what is the locus of the points where you have an angle? You know, you have lines that... You have two lines that meet at an angle, and the angle's always the same. What's the locus of those points? Well, it's part of that circle, isn't it? Okay, so the converse of that theorem, that, that was just, they just had no idea about that. Even though they'd done the theorems and they'd proved them and they could remember the proofs and they'd passed the exam with the proofs in, they, didn't, they couldn't use them in a practical problem-solving way because it's a different kind of knowledge. So it really didn't affect me very much. But there you go. So I think the two things actually complemented each other rather well. Yeah. Did you ever encounter any, um, we'll say, frustration among students when you started to take out the laptop and say, let's look at this, uh, how this is, you know, if we were to draw out a graph on this, when they're kind of going, I really just need to solve the equation, it's just, you know, don't need to draw the graph kind of thing. Have you encountered anything like that, or were they just yes. kind of positive? Yeah, you do, of course you do. Yeah, that's a normal, you know, so you, somebody's uh, under time pressure, especially at this time of year when the exam's coming up, you know, I just got to know how to do this. But that's a matter of, sort of trust, isn't it? This is only going to take 30 seconds, and that's, you, know, you have to trust me that I'm helping you. Um, so, yeah, of course, I'm, that's, a, that's a, normal, a normal sort of reaction. Not from everyone, but certainly I recognise that, yeah. Um, no, and, uh, but I, I avoided doing all those classical Euclidean constructions, ruler and compass constructions. I mean, I thought about that as a set of, um, of problems for a course like this. And in fact, I've got a very, um, what I think are a really lovely set of problems 
um, using those kinds of Euclidean constructions. So mine are not Euclidean constructions restricted to ruler and compass. I said you can do whatever buttons you like, right? I mean, that was, you know, you just, you can, it doesn't matter that it's not a Euclidean construction. That's a sort of formal game in a way, isn't it, a Euclidean construction? There's nothing particularly special about, about it other than its historical significance. Um, and there are, um, in fact, the set of problems that I'm referring to explores the difference between Euclidean constructions and uh, constructions with a marked ruler. There's a whole story there, a whole mathematical story there, which is really rather lovely. And the sequence of problems that I'm referring to explores that. Yeah, and one of the interesting, um, one of the set, of, I've designed two sets of problems for a course like this. And one of the sets of problems that I designed, the first set I designed, um, was to explore all the GeoGebra buttons. Now, some of the buttons are axiomatic, like creating a point. All right, but some of them are theorems as you, or, or constructible. So what are the relationships between the buttons? If you, which ones can you take as axioms, and from those, which other ones can you derive? Yeah, so it, you could start with just line buttons, and that creates a point. So you know you can, yeah, and, and but that's that's at the heart. That's what a formal axiomatic mathematical system is all about: those relationships between what's an axiom and what's a theorem on those assumptions. So there's a whole lot of exploration that, that that's, could be done. Um, for the purposes of the course I've just described with the, con with the constructions, I wanted to work at a, a, um, a higher level straight away because there are problems which I think are more immediately interesting than deciding whether you can construct a perpendicular or not. You know, that's quite a low level thing and I, wasn't, I didn't think that would appeal to the first years as much. That might be a very interesting second course because they, they're sort of hooked then. I mean, you, the, the, it, it, um, with this particular Moore method course, the principal role of the teacher is to choose problems that are right for the group in front of you. You know, you know your intake, you know who's there, and that, then you choose the problems, and that's, that's the job, really. <coughs>